الحمد لله وكفى والصلاه والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular in the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brothers in islam assalamu alaykum brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam were sitting and talking amongst themselves when he the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam came and asked what are you talking about And they said we're talking about the signs of the last day akhiru zaman And he said the last day would not come until and then he mentioned 10 signs And I'm sure you all familiar with the 10 they have not been given in the chronological sequence in which they will occur but here they are number 1 dajjal dajjal who is known as al-masih ad-dajjal in other words dajjal who will impersonate the true messiah and also test mankind and seek to deceive them to get mankind to bow to him and worship him rather than Allah number 2 gog and magog number 3 the return of the son of mary the true messiah number 4 dukhan or smoke and i believe that that smoke is coming within the next 20 25 years from now you don't need a phd to recognize that the two forces in the world today are moving towards collision nuclear collision you have the american alliance and the russian led alliance and they both nuclear powers you don't need a phd to know that they're going to be thousands of nuclear weapons that are going to be used in that war and one side is moving towards that door that war with a pig headed obsession pig headed obsession knowing that you're going to destroy the whole world and yet they don't care and that's the american side and the russians are saying we're not going to back down we will respond number 5 the battle of the beast of the land i recognize it to be israel number 6 that the sun would rise from the west number 7 8 and 9 three earthquakes which the earth will move and would sink down one in the east one in the west and the third one which we will easily recognize the third one which is the last one it will be in arabia an army will be coming from the north it will pass madina on its way to makkah to attack imam al mahdi and the earth will open and swallow that army so that will confirm this is number 3 and that will confirm that this man is truly imam al mahdi and number 10 that a fire will come out of yemen and drive people to their place of assembly tonight or today we want to go to number 1 the job i have spent many years of my life in the study of this subject and written several books the subject of ilmu akhiru zaman or islamic eschatology this book probably qualifies as a textbook on islamic eschatology jerusalem and the quran and we now have it as well in bahasa as a result of my study 
of Islamic eschatology, I have come to the conclusion that we now live in a world in which if you are not faithful in your worship of Allah and faithfully following Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, then you will be worshipping Dajjal. There is no third option. I have come to the conclusion that the architect of the modern age is Dajjal. And I have come to the conclusion that most of mankind are already worshipping him. Meaning they have submitted to him. For example, Al-Azhar University does not teach international monetary economics. No. And the Darul Uloom that produce your ulama, they don't teach international monetary economics. And so how? Tell me how. Can your Maulana or your Mufti or your Sheikh or your Ustad or your whatever he is, how can he give fatwa concerning paper currency when he has not studied international monetary economics? They didn't have paper money in the time of the books of fiqh. Huh? Well, I have studied international monetary economics at two universities. And on the basis of my profound study of the subject, I have come to the conclusion that this paper currency is bogus, it's fraudulent, and it's haram. And you'd be surprised how many American academics and European academics agree with me. The only people who cannot agree with me are all scholars of Islam. And so Dajjal today controls the world of money. I have come to the conclusion that the modern secular state is the creation of Dajjal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in the Quran that he is Al-Malik. And in political terminology, that means the sovereignty belongs to him. Sovereignty belongs to him. And today you now have a creature called the modern secular state. And those who defend it have not even studied sufficient political science to understand its genesis, its origin. And the modern secular state which has embraced the whole world declares that no, sovereignty does not belong to Allah. Sovereignty now belongs to the state. Well, whoever wants to accept that and believe in it and act upon it should have the freedom to do so. And when they go to the grave, they must be prepared for the consequences of that. That's all. But the rest of us would say, no. We want to remain faithful to Allah and to his messenger. And so in our hearts, we long for the return of the Khilafah. The Khilafah state, which recognizes Allah's sovereignty. This is our heart. In your heart, you may pledge allegiance to that state. In our heart, we pledge allegiance to the Khalifa. That's the economic aspect, that's the monetary aspect, that's the political aspect. But Dajjal is testing us in other ways as well. The Prophet said alayhi salatu waslam that the last people to come out to Dajjal would be women. And a man would have to return to his home and tie down, meaning coercively restrain his wife, his sister, his daughter, to protect them from being seduced by Dajjal. We recognize that to be the modern feminist, Western feminist revolution, which is now seeking to establish its base in Muslim society as well. We know we would recognize that feminist revolution when it comes. 
the last people to come out to Dajjal will be women. How would you recognize it? He said women would be dressed and would yet be naked. So when you see women dressed and yet naked, there's the evidence. These are the last people to come out to the job. Some people would be annoyed with the Prophet for speaking like this. <laughs> yes. He said that women would dress like men. So you see them with a jacket and the trousers and if you go to McDonald's you see them with a tie as well and some people would be annoyed with the Prophet yes annoyed with him for exposing this fraud why would women want to dress like men why they don't know so I have to tell them why the answer is Dajjal wants to disrupt and overturn, turn upside down the functional role of men and women in society. Allah ordained one thing and mankind recognized it all through history that men had a functional role in society different from women. That men were supposed to work and to maintain women and that men were supposed to guard and protect women and as a consequence of which women were obliged to be obedient obedient to their husbands, obedient to their guardians Dajjal contests that Dajjal does not want to hear anything about women being obedient to their husbands no, 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 that belongs to an old age that's gone. This is the new age. This is an age of enlightenment. This is an age where there is no discrimination. And so women don't have to be obedient to their husbands. Wake up to the modern world. Which one? The modern age of Dajjal. And in this modern age, a woman must have the freedom to pursue any activity she wants to pursue. Anything a man does, a woman should have the freedom to do it. And so women assume the functional role of men in society. And when they do that, it has calamitous consequences for marriage and for the family. Calamitous consequences. If we had enough time, we would have been able to take up the subject of marriage and give you the perspective from Islam, give you the philosophy of gender in Islam before turning to the institution of marriage and its functions. But we don't have that time in the short time we have left. Is it time for the azan now? Shall we have the azan and then continue or shall we, what shall we do? Hmm? Continue. Continue, okay. He said that men would dress like women. 1400 years ago he said that. And of course the first thing that a man has to do, but why would men want to dress like women? Is it to assume the functional role of women in society? Or is it to attract another man? Is it that he's prophesying that this age that glitters like gold is going to culminate with men marrying men and getting a marriage certificate? And that is the ultimate achievement of modern Western Dajjal civilization? And that women would marry women? That is your progress? The first thing that a man would have to do if he wants to dress like a woman is to shave off the beard. That's the first thing he has to do. Whether it's a big growth or whether it's a small growth, it's still a beard. Why did Allah place the beard on the face of the male? 
There are two answers. The first, of course, is that you'll be able to distinguish from a distance the male from the female. It's a divine wisdom. The divine wisdom. The second reason, of course, you know it, don't you? So children can play with the bed. Huh? And all of mankind kept the bed all through history until the Jal struck with his civilization. Modern Western civilization took off the bed and now every civilized male who wants to get promotion in his job, <laughs> who wants to reach the top, every civilized male who wants to look clean must shave off his beard. Because if you keep a beard, you're dirty. That's the brainwashing that now passes for civilization in this godless age of ignorance. More than that, it's not just that you're clean when you shave off. It's the corollary that if you have a beard, you're a terrorist. Hmm? And so there is an attack which has been launched on the male-female relationship, which is, of course, the foundation of marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. And in the marriage between a man and a woman, Allah explains, at the beginning of Surah An-Nisa, the first ayah, وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَالنِّسَاءَ That the purpose of marriage, the f purpose of marriage as explained by he who created you from a drop of sperm and in whose hand is your life. In this verse, he says the purpose of marriage is children, procreation, so that mankind will survive. If you are to have children, how can a marriage of a man with a man produce children? How can a marriage of a woman with a woman produce children? And yet there is a tomorrow which is coming when every single government, every single government will have to bow. They'll have to bow before the UN and before the IMF and before the World Bank and before this and that and the other and they will have to enact legislation in every single Muslim country to legalize the marriage of a man with a man. It's coming. You don't believe me? Well, just wait and see. They have bowed in everything else so far. So they're going to bow in this as well and prostrate. But marriage in Islam is between a man and a woman so children can be born. It's so simple. Why should we bow? Why should we bow to those who are seeking to get us to worship them rather than to Allah? And when you marry, when you marry, Allah speaks of marriage as an institution that is meant for Jannah. For Jannah. Because the first marriage that took place was when Allah created from Adam alayhi salam, He created his spouse, Hawa alayhi salam. And then He said to both of them, Uskun anta wa al Jannah. Go and dwell in paradise. And so the very essence of marriage is something that belongs to paradise. And hence something that is spiritual. And in Surah to Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about marriage. Woman ayatihi, and amongst his signs is this. 
أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها that he has created for you from amongst your very mates your very cells he has created your mates your spouses لتسكنوا إليها that you might dwell with them in a state of sukun Sukun is peace and contentment and tranquility. There are things in life which money cannot buy. And Sukun is one of them. And so marriage is for paradise. And in paradise, this is what you get, Sukun. And if you marry here, in Allah's name, and you live in accordance with Allah's law then you get a piece of paradise right here on earth because you're marrying in Allah's name and you're living with her to please Allah what does he say about marriage when you get married in Surah Al-Baqarah he says it is no halal for you in the nights of fasting to go to your wives prior to this it was not permissible because the previous Sharia was being used the one in the Torah and in that Sharia fasting began at sunset and continued until the following sunset no food no drink and you could not go to your wives but now a new law comes down and now it is halal in the nights of fasting because the fast begins at dawn and it ends at sunset so Allah says أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةَ الصِّيَامِ الرَّفَثُ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ it's now halal for you to go to your wives on the nights of fasting. You are inseparable like you and your clothing. Do you ever forget your clothing at work, at home when you come to work? Huh? I don't think you ever do that. Forget your clothing at home when you come to work? No, you are inseparable. You and your clothing. So to you are inseparable, the male and the female and then he goes on to say alim allahu annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum fataba alaykum you see we were supposed to stay away from them while fasting in the night time the previous law but some of us didn't do that some of us secretly used to go to them so Allah says I know what you used to do and I have turned towards you mercifully and forgiven you now there's a new law Fal'an, and so now, Ba'ashiruhunna. Now embrace them, your wives, in the nights of fasting. And when you embrace them, what do you do? Wabtagu ma kataballahu lakum. And now seek for what Allah has written for you. So Allah does the writing. That's what He says. Allah determines how many children you have. Terengganu knows that very well. Allah determines how many will be male and how many will be female. But along comes Dajjal with his new godless age. And he says, nope. That's irresponsible conduct. To believe that Allah should do the right thing. Oh no, no, no. In this modern age of Dajjal, we take over and we will do the writing ourselves we'll decide how many children we'll have it's called planned parenthood and we'll decide how to space them off and we'll decide how many will be male and how many female normally one male one boy and one girl the American Sunnah <laughs> now if that is all that Allah gave you and you want more children but that's all that Allah gave you that's not the American Sunnah that's what Allah gave you 
But if you have a pre-decision, I want a boy and a girl. And you sit down with your wife and you all plan and decide, okay, the boy first, and then seven years later the girl, and then close the shop. Hmm? You're committing shirk. You're committing shirk. And the amazing thing is you'll be committing shirk without even knowing it. Without even knowing it. But Dajjal's attack is more profound than that. What he does is to, you know, the hadith is that Dajjal sees with one eye, the left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word. The word? Kafir. Why are you afraid to say it? <laughs> Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word Kafir. And every mu'min will be able to read it. Whether the mu'min is katib or ghayr or kaftib. Literate or illiterate, still be able to read it. Our understanding, and Allah knows best, is that the left eye symbolizes external sight. And that the blind right eye symbolizes internal blindness. And so from this emerges what we call an epistemology. The philosophy of knowledge, epistemology. That knowledge comes only from external observation, the scientific method. And knowledge does not come from internal insight. From the time you declare that knowledge comes only from external observation, then the path becomes predetermined for you. If the only thing that you can know is that which you can observe, this is the only world you can observe, Hence, this is the only world that you can know. Then one day you will be led to conclude, this is the only world that exists. Let me repeat that. If the only thing that you can know is that which you can observe, and this is the only world that you can observe, it follows that this is the only world that you can know. And when you accept that this is the only world that you can know, one day you'll be led to, to conclude that this is the only world that exists. For all intents and purposes, practical reality, most of mankind now accept that this is the only world that exists. If this is the only world that exists, then there is no reality beyond material reality. Welcome to Dajjal. So that woman there, that's all she is, she's a woman. She's flesh and she's blood and she's bones. She's a thing to be enjoyed. And there's nothing in her beyond her material being. And when woman is approached in that context, then love eventually gives way to lust. When woman is approached with that conception of reality, it's only a matter of time before love will give way to lust. And that is the destruction of happiness in marriage. And that's where we are today. At no time in history have there been more divorces than there are today. That is progress. That's progress. Divorces are becoming so common now that tomorrow marriage is for the birds. Nobody's going to bother about marriage. You use her and you enjoy her until she becomes 
like the old withered branch of a date palm and then you look for another schoolgirl. Is that the Azan? You look for another young woman and discard the old woman. When there's love in the heart, she's never old. <laughs> when there's love in your heart, she'll always be young in your eyes. When there's love in the heart, you'll never discard her. When there's love in the heart, you long, I want you not only in this world, I want you in the next world as well. But when there's lust, come bring me the next one. And make sure she's young. And then bring me another one. And make sure she's young. And so you have, you have the substance of a sexual revolution. Nabi Muhammad said the time will come when people will have sexual intercourse in public like donkeys and that's where we're heading is that progress? is there any government in the world which could prevent the movement in that direction? show me one I don't know anyone What we are witnessing, therefore, because of Dajjal's attack, what we are witnessing before our very eyes is a program placed, put in place for the eventual collapse of society. So people performing sexual intercourse in public like donkeys, that's the collapse of society. I got an email from an African student in Paris two three mornings ago. He said, Sheikh, he's a university student, he said, Sheikh, all I have to do is to go to my dormitory window and look outside and I can see them having sexual intercourse in public. They probably come to the front porch of the apartment, they remove the blinds and so on. So if you're in the next building, you can watch them and see them. They do it in parks in Britain and they turn on the lights in the motor car and they're doing it in the car and people passing by and watching and one friend of mine here in KL told me he was walking on a street in Tokyo and he saw them in public in Tokyo this is the modern age of Dajjal and it's time for us to recognize that Dajjal now controls the modern age it is time for us to recognize that we live in that age of the greatest test and trial that mankind will ever experience. And that unless and until we remain faithful to Allah and follow his messenger, we will be worshipping the job. I think the time is up. Uh, I don't know whether we have any time for questions, do we? Ten minutes? Ten minutes? All right, if we have any questions...